Hi, I'm Emma, she, her. And I'm Jess, she, her. And this is Fluff, the podcast about friendship, love, unfortunate failure and fun. (laughs) Good afternoon. Or evening, or morning, morning. <laughs> whenever you're listening. Midday snack time. And wherever you're listening. See. We've had an amazing week since our release, which was last Friday. We are overwhelmed by the feedback and positivity. Yes, thank you so much to everybody who has listened and then reached out to us and sent your feedback how the podcast made you feel and that you've got that solidarity that we really wanted to send across and thank you to people who um, are close friends who we speak to regularly and thank you to people who we don't know personally or we haven't spoken to in years um, each comment is really lovely and we did say we did bear yeah. our souls by putting out this podcast so it's nice to know that and our bums and our bums <laughs> So it's nice to know um, that it's been received well and we are pumped and therefore we are releasing how many podcasts this week, Emma? Two new ones Two this new Friday, episodes. baby. <laughs> um, and yeah, thanks for all of the support. Every message you sent has been treasured, but also every share has been lovely. People have been telling their friends, putting it on their Insta stories. Tag us. We will retweet you. We will repost you. Um, it's really exciting for us. So thank you for being such good friends for more wherever you are. We're just excited to get even more friends and make better friendships. Yay! <laughs> What's our drink tonight, Jess? Yes. Well, um, I have actually trained in mixology, so I'm quite passionate for the old cocktails. Ooh! Mm. And our cocktail is thematic to our exciting topic today, which is body hair. So we are drinking a cocktail called the Hairy Navel. Yeah. Or the Fuzzy navel, 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 navel. Apparently, they are the same thing. Fuzzy, hairy, however you like to describe yourself. Yes. Or maybe you call it the hairy nipple or fuzzy nipple. We've got a bit confused. I with think what... nipple's a different one. I think that's a different thing. But this is a. We're we're gonna stick with hairy. Yes. A hairy navel. And in the hairy navel, podcast listeners, you will find fifty mils of vodka. You will find twenty five mils of peach snaps, and then just some plain old OJ, orange juice, but because we're fancy, we've put a slice of mm, orange around the glass. I would say this isn't my usual choice because it's quite sweet and I'm a bit of a, I'm a bit of a cocktail snob, but should we try it and see how it goes down in my bar? What do you mean by snob? Because you don't like sweet is what you're saying. I don't like kind of orange juice in my drinks. Ah, see, I'm the opposite. I love a citrus cocktail. I don't like a sweet cocktail, but I like a citrusy one. So the peach schnapps turned me off, but the orange will hopefully get me through. And the vodka turned me on. Exactly. (laughs) Cheers! Cheers! Oh. oh, I'm oh, into it. Yeah, quite good. See, and what's quite nice is we have a really huge orange rind, <laughs> which we can smell as you sip it. Yeah, it definitely bonks your nose on the way in. <laughs> you can taste the vodka, that's mm. for sure. Maybe I actually put some. Maybe that's our ooh moment. Just, mm. Mm, alcohol. Yeah, Lovely. I'm into it. I think this is a good thing. I recommend this as if you are going to have an alcoholic brunch. Yeah. It's a good one well, to maybe sub for a mimosa. It's quite, I think, maybe quite heavy for morning alcohol. Well, who knows? <laughs> but a good, it's definitely a good, like, it feels like a day drink kind of outside sort of scenario. Yeah. And you, the peach snaps isn't too it does, sweet. It does taste dangerous, though, for a day drink. It's like a quick, it's a slippery slope to... Um, yeah, that's yeah. what I mean. The orange juice covers up the sins. Yeah. Um, but for, you know what, I've surprised myself. I'm into mm. it. Mm. Well, happy drinking. There we go. So, body hair. Mm-hmm. An important topic for and some of us. <laughs> yes. Maybe you have gone on a body hair journey. and um, Maybe you are very connected to your body hair. Some people don't have much body hair and oh, could be in different ways. Mm. Um, but I suppose we all have a lot of hair anecdotes and 
grow hair in various places. Yeah. And we really wanted to talk about it. I suppose hair is very much everybody's identity. And it could be a problematic part of your identity or maybe you've learned to love it or grow to love it in different ways. And we want to share with you our body hair journeys, which are well tapestried. <laughs> Braided. Yeah, so I'm a hairy person. I I would describe myself as a bit of an otter because I also like swimming and holding hands when I sleep. Um, oh. But <laughs> I've written on our notes here that I've had a lifelong battle with hair and hair removal. If you've seen any images of us, I've got very dark hair and very light skin. So my uh, hair shines through in every bit of my body. There isn't a part of me that doesn't have a fuzz on it. And in lots of places, it's black fuzz. So not as attractive, you might think, or I thought for most of my life. Um, And I think also we are, we know we are two white girls talking about body hair. And we know that hair, head hair, body hair is different for every race and the way it shows up on your body and what's expected of you. But unfortunately in this world, it would seem that most, especially female bodies, are um, held to the white, fair-haired standard. I can imagine women and men across the world and non-binary people have a struggle with trying to figure out what to do with their hair. Yes, and it reminds me that when I've visited different countries, and particularly um, when I lived in Southeast Asia, seeing everywhere outside the hair salons there still white women on the posters. Everywhere, yeah. Yeah, when I travelled India, that was the case as well. Which is just really sad to see not the citizens of the um, surrounding communities represented in the posters that are up in their hair salon. And when we talk about hair removal on the body, um, it's easy to think that that's just a a female identifying kind of issue. But I can guarantee that men have body hair trauma as well. Um, Whether that's being too hairy, not hairy enough, not being able to grow facial hair, having unruly facial hair, hair in your nether regions on your private. Some people like it, some people don't like it. But it's just sort of no one knows what to expect and everyone's got a... Mm groom in different ways i remember it wasn't that long ago i discovered how much hair i had around my asshole (laughs) there it is everyone i just hadn't checked it before and then i was like whoa it was actually my ex told me oh yeah you've got a hairy asshole i said what do i but doesn't everyone that's a i mean that's a question for all of you i believe that it's there as a cleaning protective kind of scenario it has its function you have your pubic hair yeah so We are going to share some of our own personal hair stories. And going back, we were thinking about our earliest body hair shame. And Mm. I remember being maybe 11 or 12 and I had a monobrow, which wasn't celebrated like Frida Kahlo. Oh, no. I had a monobrow and I didn't even notice. I had no idea. Just one day at school, I started getting teased about my monobrow And when I went home, I cried to my mum and I said, everyone said, I've got a monobrow. What is a monobrow? And I remember my mum saying, Jessica, it's time. And she went and got the tweezers Mm. and she had noticed it. She knew it, but I think she was waiting for me to maybe see that I had a monobrow and see if I wanted to do something about it. But... I do remember there was a bit of excitement, I think, about getting the hands on the monobrow and plucking it away. But I just remember that being, I hadn't noticed one day and then somebody told me and Mm. teased me about it and then I was like, oh, this is a bad thing that I've got growing in between my eyebrows. That's essentially my experience as well, except for that I was a bit younger because it was more obvious. I was probably, I mean, I was aware of my body hair from about seven, but eight or nine was when it got pointed out in school. Um, and it was it wasn't even my monobrow which I had because it was that was totally overshadowed by the forest that was on my legs and the uh, fields on my upper lip. My mustache mm. was what I was most often teased about, and it was at that time quite light in color, like it wasn't very dark. And I can tell you, every woman has hair on their upper lip, but as I started puberty and I started puberty quite early. It was darkening and that just happens with hormones. That Hormones completely rule your facial hair mm-hmm. and body hair. So mm-hmm. it's really normal, but I just specifically remember 
Michael making a comment about me having a mustache and my sister was aware of it and she's seven years older than me so she had also been through her own battle and my mom had as well so my sister was the one who said to mom can we talk about Emma's eyebrows lips (laughs) and armpits and I remember they bought me a Gillette razor and we bleached our lips for the first time and I shaved my legs and I was under 10 under 10 yeah could you talk to any friends about it I didn't for a few years because they were all a couple years behind me in the experience of it so by the time I was in middle school other girls were doing the same but in primary school I was the only one I mean I was the only one wearing a bra as well Mm. (laughs) everything just sort of happened in early days but uh yeah no one else that I know of was shaving and definitely no one talked about bleaching lips or waxing eyebrows Mm. did it feel like something you were going through alone never alone because I am from a family of otters so (laughs) sorry to my family (laughs) but uh my mum's genes are strong and so are our hair follicles so Mm uh my sister was vital to me um as a guide even though I sort of we took different paths for our eyebrows she went super skinny and I went bushy bushy but my brother even has been through his own journey. So it was a topic and it was something we would be plucking our eyebrows and wearing our bleach in front of our dad and like it was out and about. And Mm -hmm. I remember dad making jokes all the time about why is his bedroom a spa because that's where we would be where mum's doing our eyebrows in turn. So it felt like an open topic, but not with friends. I suppose inspirational friends moving forward to adulthood. I think my body hair journey took a real turn when I came out as a lesbian, Mm. when I was thinking about my gender and gender identity and where I felt I placed myself. And body hair was a huge part of that. Firstly was armpit hair. (laughs) And I have an incredible friend, and we have an incredible friend, who was definitely my armpit hair inspiration, Mm. who used to dye her hair, armpit hair blue. I think sometimes glitter it as well. Yeah. And I started rocking that. And then I suddenly just loved having hairs on my legs. I was channeling my my butchness during that time. (laughs) Yeah. Swinging around, playing around within uh, my gender identity. But the thing that... The hair removal that I do do still today is the occasional Brazilian wax. Um, And I choose to do that maybe before I know... I'm going to have a specific romantic encounter, baby. I feel, I still feel like I like to do that. But waxing your vulva area um, (laughs) has brought me some stories. And I can recommend, do look at the ratings of the places that you book a waxing treatment. And the reviews, and the reviews. Yes. We have this um, app called Treatwell available um, where you can book an appointment that's near to you at any time and I used to sometimes look at the price range and go for the cheapest Mm. and one time I ended up going down weird alleyways to get to this new waxing place and you should be using hot wax on the vulva area and on the inner thigh because it's very sensitive skin but this um, lady was using cold strip wax and it's so excruciatingly painful and I knew she didn't know what she was doing and she was making kind of scared faces Anyway, wax finished, I went home and I was waiting for... My partner had been away at the time and I was waiting for her to come home and have some romantic times. And (laughs) I remember, I hadn't quite realised, she started to travel down to nether regions and (laughs) she looked up at me with a look of disgust and panic and said, what's that? And then I looked down and I was bruised and the bruises looked like um <laughs> love bites and i and i had to have a second where i was like what is all of this purple mark oh, over no, me and yeah. it was the wax yeah she'd bruised me i mean i've bled i've had skin rip off if you, oh, if people God. don't know how to do it it's painful and i mean waxing is painful enough so if you're going to be going down that road we're going to talk about do's and don'ts a little bit later on but just pay that extra bit or learn to do it yourself because I now do my own and 
I wouldn't go back. I almost don't trust other people near that yeah. area yeah. anymore. Or let it grow and just be yeah. Like it. Do whatever Mine goes you feel down my thighs with. quite a bit. So, and that's just how it is. Yeah. So my adult trauma with hair, body hair, is not so much to do with legs and and uh, pubic hair, even though that's plenteous. Um, but I'm I feel like I came to terms with that quite early, and I will shave or wax or whatever. Um, but that's only for a partner, and I've been quite lucky with partners who don't question what my choice is there. I I had mono, which is the kissing disease, is what they call it, when I was 17 years old. And that changes your hormonal structure. And before that, uh, my facial hair on my cheeks and my chin was just like, like the white fuzz that you wouldn't actually see on your face. And afterwards, it was darker. It was considerably darker all over. Essentially, anywhere anyone has a beard, that's where it was slightly darker. So I started um, waxing my whole face which made it come back a bit darker. And then I paid for laser treatment. Well, I didn't pay because I was still a teen. My mum, because the beautiful, lovely, equally hairy person that she is, has devoted a lot of her adult life and parenting time and funds to helping my sister and I rid ourselves using modern technology of uh, hair. But this particular, she paid for laser and this was at not in a clinic, but in just your average hair salon. Mm. And what I've learned now, and again, we'll talk about do's and don'ts a bit later on, is that that particular laser that they can have in a hair salon is not a licensed, it doesn't need a clinician to run it. So it's a lighter power, which means that it's just going to zap the hairs and not kill them fully and actually can stimulate more growth and stronger growth. So I had not only the hormonal imbalance, but then this laser situation. So by the time I was 22, I couldn't go more than six hours without shaving my chin, or it would look like I had a goatee because it was thick, black and coarse and waxing it and plucking it hurt. And it was like maybe five or six hairs growing out of each follicle. It was Mm -hmm. thick and intense. And actually I've only managed to find the solution in the last two years so they're happy with where I'm at now but that was really embarrassing really hard when first dating people really hard when meeting people because I always just thought people were looking at my chin Mm -hmm. because when it's on your face it's really hard to you can't just cover up and ignore it and that also makes me think Emma it's important to highlight the struggles and the trauma that trans or non-binary people can experience I have a trans um, family member and I know that uh, because hair is used as such a mark of gender identity yeah that people use hair to assume somebody's gender question somebody's gender and basically who gives a fuck about where people have hair or how much they have but that can be just a really difficult experience for somebody who might want to have more hair or um, not have hair yeah. in certain places. So just be kind to each other. It's hair. But it's, it's, so, hair. it's so intrinsically linked to gender because even as a cisgendered woman, I'm so upset with my face because it's what I don't think I should have for my gender. So mm-hmm. it's it's more about, it's not even about what I think it looks like. It's more about, it's like I have a manly face and mm-hmm. that's quite hard and yeah it was all happening while I was coming out as well so there's Mm -hmm. just it's a complicated hair has a lot to do with how you feel about yourself sure and podcast listeners we just chucked a cheeky word out there didn't Mm. we cisgender and for anybody who is new to the word cisgender cisgender means that you identify as the sex that you were assigned at birth so i.e male or i.e female So a little bit of education there, perhaps, for you. Yeah. Moving, can I move up from my nether region here? Yeah, let's move out. To the top of my head. I'll start, uh, we'll get into hair dye because that is a biggie. Um, But I have an undercut, which is where you might shave a part of your head, maybe at the side of your head, maybe at the base of your head near your neck. And I initially got an undercut. I shaved it a few years ago. Um, and I purely, the pure and solid reason was, 
as a symbol of my lesbian identity <laughs> and just so that I could walk around and if I maybe was just trying to indicate to somebody, yeah. by the way, I'm gay, which also is linked into the fact that I wasn't sure if people would know I was gay because, again, people were thinking, oh, maybe she's she's quite femme, though. She doesn't look gay. Okay. And so I felt that after coming out, I, I really wanted to... You meet, want the I hot to girls meet. to look at you. I know. I was like, check my undercut <laughs> yeah. out. And, like, with a little wink, like... You see? Because throughout history, everybody, it's so interesting, but queer people have used different kind of symbols Mm. or things to indicate. Indicate. Yeah. Such as, like, lesbians used to use monocle glasses. They used to use them in Victorian times. So the modern-day monocle is the undercut. And I've had it for a few years now, and I suppose it's helped me. Which um, is also not to say that anyone with an undercut is a lesbian. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. It's also become quite trendy, because it yeah. looks good. But it's definitely a common theme amongst our yes. community. But now that I've been, you know, I'm very solid in my identity, and I'm all right for letting everybody know, I now kind of want to grow out a little bit, because my hair is thinned so much from dyeing it. But now I'm struggling with how to do that. But what I would like to share is some really ridiculous experiences in barbers. I have picked barbers sometimes just in the locality of where I live in London, um, which are not queer friendly. And there are some incredible queer friendly barbers out there, such as open barbers. Yeah. So I've had two particularly um, horrific experiences going into barbers to simply ask them, can you shave my undercut? Yeah. And so a, and a barber, I think, especially in the UK, but maybe in lots of Western countries, but just in case you're not from here, um, they tend to be run by male identifying people serving male clientele. So they are expecting, uh, it's only for sort of shaving, short haircuts. You couldn't go in there as a woman with long hair or a person with long hair and say oh do this kind of style for me it's just for yeah traditionally for men exactly and when they might charge a guy for 15 pounds for his whole head i've had experiences where i go in and i ask for my little blob of undercut done and they're like yeah 20 pounds i'm like i will give you five pounds and that is it but i've had two really um horrific experiences the first one was I went into a barber's and I said, can you shave my undercut? He said, yes, sat on down. It was just me and him at the salon. It was dark. It was at night, which kind of added to my sense of vulnerability. And he said to me, as he started shaving, I hear lesbians have undercuts. Ugh. And I've got my head like tilted to the side and With he's shaving. Razor. Yeah. And he said, are you a lesbian? And I'm just like, oh, God. And I can't remember what I answered to that. I think I just said, um, well, yes, but an undercut doesn't signify that you are only a lesbian. Yeah. And then he started to say to me, how do lesbians have sex? Do you come? How do you come? Uh... What does the come look like? Sorry, this is a bit explicit, but this is the truth. And then he said, can I watch? Or whilst I had my head tilted to the side and he was shaving my head. So scary. It was really scary and I felt really sick Mm -hmm. and I was frozen in panic. Like I was in panic um, fight or flight mode. So screw you, Barbara, for making me feel like that. Yeah. This reminds me as well of (laughs) a slightly funnier version, but not funny at the same time. I, uh, when I first moved out of London, I had got a new hairdresser um, who did a great job and she was a lovely person and I was in a sort of short bob at that point. Um, but they made an assumption right off the bat because I mentioned that I'd moved here after a breakup, that it had been a man. And I just got a vibe that if I said woman, it would have been wrong. So I just sort of said, yeah, and then liked the haircut so much. So went back multiple times, but then was dating Ingrid and just couldn't Because you know hairdressers chat. So I just couldn't Mm. keep it up anymore. And I've just, I've had to ghost this hairdresser. Because she sent me like, come back, like messages and discounts. But I don't know. It's one of those things, right? When you're like, oh, is this a safe person to come out to? I don't really know. So I said I didn't. And then um, I think there's so much gendering. And there's so much expectation in salons yeah. and barbers that yeah. you're one way or the other. And it's a really vulnerable position because you're sitting in a chair yeah. with scissors and razors mm. and you can't just kind of leap out of the chair when you've got the cloth around yeah. oh you my God, I did in the barbers. A, I did this with an aesthetician as well, someone who was waxing me once. 
Because yeah. you're just How vulnerable, can you get out? so you're not going to be like, Your yeah, legs spread. I'm queer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the second experience, I went to another barber's, and again, I said, can I have my undercut done? He said, yes. And he's shaving my undercut, and all of the rest of my hair, which was very long at the time, was flicked over to the other side. He then was talking, he picked up a pair of scissors, grabbed my hair, and just lopped, cut several inches off of my hair. I didn't know this one. Whoa. Yeah. And he just said, I used to be a hairdresser. That hair was dead and needed to come off. Did I say anything? No, because what? I was frozen in fear. Yeah. He just cut loads of my hair off. And I just said, can you please just finish the cut? And what did I say? Thank you. And Gave you him the money. Him. Yeah. I walked out and I cried all the way home because he cut off so much of my long hair. And I, yes, it was dead. Yes, it had split ends. But that's for you to decide. That was for me to decide. Ah. And also, just thinking of vulnerable, you just reminded we're speaking about being in vulnerable positions. Team, if you've ever had <laughs> <laughs> a, a a wax of your asshole. The first time, oh my gosh, what positions have you been in for having yeah. your asshole wax? It's essentially yoga, but then someone puts <laughs> hot wax on you and rips your hair out of your body. Yeah. Isn't it? It's like downward dog. Yeah. With but your bum hole. There's so many different positions. Sometimes you're on all fours and you have to part your butt cheeks. Yeah. Sometimes. Oh, I, I like when they let make you get involved though, because then I feel like there's I have an element of control yeah. when they're like, just spread that skin for me. Yeah. And I if mean, they don't ask you to spread the skin... I'd be a bit concerned because I don't think there's enough hands to properly spread. Because spreading the skin, if you've never had a wax before, just to clarify, spreading the skin on your sort of jiggly bits means that it's tense and you're not going to pull the skin at the same time as the hair. So it's really important that you, it's as tight as possible. Yeah, that you have your hands free. Emma, have you ever had... I call this cocking the leg position for your asshole, where I'm going to actually do it right now, where you are on, you're laying on your side and then yeah. you cock your leg and uh, then you lift up the ass cheek. Can I say, I've only had the asshole done once and uh. I was like, do you know what? I'm okay with being hairy there. Well done, you. Um, and I only get, I get a deep bikini, but I, and I've only had a Brazilian once and that was the same time I had the asshole. So I'm all right, to be honest. So if you do not know the um, types of waxes, just to let you know, a Brazilian is basically all gone, yeah. except a little landing strip, they yeah. call it. The nudie, nudie Rudy. The nudie one, Rudy. Essentially. And a bar, any more well, anecdotes? my... It's funny because my I've had loads of hair experiences, painful and whatever, but I think the most traumatic experience is not my own, but I was heavily dangerously involved in. <laughs> to, I can still smell, I can access this memory so clearly, which it, I think I need to talk about it in therapy. Um, my my dear big bro, my dear big brother, he is quite... He's a beautiful, sexy man, apparently, all my friends tell me. He's always been sort of the heartthrob of my friend group. Um, but also, is a he's a hairy beast, essentially. He, I mean, and I can say that because he's what I would be if I had been born mm-hmm. um, with a different sex. So, uh, <laughs> and he has hair or had hair, I don't actually know anymore, maybe he can let me know, on his chest and his back in quite thick and we were going on a um hot holiday in winter a hot holiday a hot holiday so to the islands because can i just picture what island you were on i think we were going to the bahamas okay everybody so, we're traveling to the bahamas because for this story. from canada it's very frequent that canadians would fly to florida or the caribbean because it's close and actually you get amazing deals for families to go for spring break so this was a spring break holiday Gorgeous. and he's maybe 20 at this point which means i'm 11 or 12 somewhere in there and my sister's with us as well um so at this point no one had any partners because i'm 11 and gay and don't know it yet and (laughs) so we are all staying in one hotel room the night before we fly because to fly to the caribbean from canada you leave at 3 a.m so we sort of you go stay in an airport hotel and then go especially if you're a kid and my brother had bought boxes of nair hair removal which is the chemical hair removal that literally burns it out of your body it stinks as it's well. Horrendous. And he decided that he wanted to nair his entire back. 
No, his hair. And when he said he want to do this, he meant my sisters <laughs> will do this for me. <laughs> so he's got this cream and spreads it all over his back and you have to wait a certain amount of time. And I just remember being in this hotel room with the little scraper tool removing the thick, thick, thick black hair from his back and the smell of like burning hair a bit it's a bit poopy smelling mixed with the cucumber smell of the actual cream and like scraping it off of his like he's very tall he's like six five it's a big back we're just <laughs> we're working away as sisters diligently helping our brother get through this and it's so it was so disgusting but I also think that was like the top the epitome of love of sis- sibling love there so was the disgust in the smell? And but the, even the result, like, it just yeah. means that you have a stubbly back then for your whole holiday. Yeah. And I don't remember, but I'm sure he had loads of ingrown hairs because that's <gasps> what happens from improper hair removal. I just think nair and any sort of chemical burning of hair is... Yeah. I it still does smell. Steer away from that. I don't think that's healthy. Mm. You did just mention ingrowing hairs. Oh, yes. And being... I mean, the response from our podcast listeners so far is that you, like... The honesty. But I just want to say... Oh, uh, no. I know what you're going to say. I do like an ingrown hair. It's yeah. quite fun. I like things like spots and plucking. Emma does not like that. I Yeah, I'm a bit squeamish about that sort of thing. I mean, I'll talk about them because I... Let me tell you, I've had the experiences of the ingrown hairs, <laughs> but I'm not prepared to talk about... I don't know! The I'm just squirty g- ones or the oh, painful ones. I wasn't even going to go to squirty, <laughs> but you went there. Yeah, well, I f- remembered that we have to be honest on the podcast. That's the whole point. That is the whole point. And we're not just being gross. But I think they're really painful. That's the worst thing about an ingrown well, hair. Well, that's why it has they're to more, come out. It's more painful than a spot. An ingrown hair is when you've shaved or removed the hair and then so the... the um, what am I saying? Like the skin grows over the follicle. The skin has grown over the spot where it would have grown out. And basically it goes to go up and then curls back down or over to the side. or And is still growing underneath your skin. So it becomes infected around the hair. Um, and so there's been occasions where you can like get the infection out. But you've not been able to access the hair. So it's like a recurring You're just waiting. hair. And those get so painful. Emma, can I tell you a secret? Oh no, what? I managed to get an ingrown hair out this morning, which I've been waiting a good week for it to come out. Oh. Maybe two weeks. Two weeks of pain. Because I had a blimmin' Brazilian, didn't I? Yeah. But I didn't get the romantic treat at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, COVID. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I have a few I could show you at the moment, but maybe maybe afterwards, maybe private time. <laughs> maybe after another hairy navel cocktail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me about um, hairs growing out of moles as well, oh, yeah. which is important to note that um, I know in different cultures as well, um, the hair out of the moles... Um, means different things and it can oh, cool. also be um quite i think a spiritual connection maybe as well um, oh, i'm quite spiritual then <laughs> yes but i remember i have a, a mole on my lower back which i'm not aware of 24 7 and once i've broken up with my ex the next time i had a little rendezvous with somebody um she told me like oh well you have loads of hairs coming out of that mole but i didn't i'd never even noticed but yeah so hairs yeah. come out of moles and you might not even know. Moles and freckles and they're darker generally. Oh, I'm, I'm looking at right now. They're darker than all the other. Like this is all like light fuzz and that's a dark one out of a freckle on my arm. But I have one on my back which just, I don't know what it is. It grows out of a mole and it's very fine. It's not actually very dark, but it gets freakishly long. Like as mm. long as my fringe long. <laughs> and I don't notice it until it's that length. And yeah. Then it's like, eh, see, look. <gasps> There's there another one! Oh, do you see that? No, oh, look, I just look, saw in the it light. in the light. In the light. <gasps> look okay. how freakishly long that gets. I think that's about an inch, podcast listeners. And it's growing straight out of my body. It's also very blonde. Exactly. So it's that's why you don't notice it until it's long enough that you can like literally grab it with your fist and pluck it out of the body. If you want to do I kind of want to put it out. Pull, pull, pull. Oh. oh. Now I've just curled it. Oh. It's I think it's a tweezer there. job. It might be a tweezer. Yeah. I kind of want to use my teeth. <laughs> I mean, go for it. Well, all right. I okay. might need to save this for afterwards. I'm going to save it for after. 
Talk about liveness. <laughs> <laughs> Carrying on with the head hair, mm. um, I would like to just share some anecdotes about my hair dye journey, which recently Emma and I have linked up on just to do well, it together. <laughs> you know, so I've always been envious of Jess because Jess has beautiful, and for the last forever since I've known you you've always had dyed hair but like fun color dyed hair it used to yeah. be bright red and then you went even more wicked with your blues and colors um but because I've got black 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 hair I've always sort of thought oh that's not for me mm-hmm. I'll wait till I go gray mm. <laughs> but uh in recent well a couple months ago I got some streaks but already because quarantine is inspiring us all I, we've already decided to do a little bit more but Emma, that's how it begins. I know, it's a slippery slope. And yeah. I'm aware that I've got, I'm quite happy with my head hair. The mm-hmm. good thing about being a hairy person is that your head hair is great. Yeah. Emma has the strongest, shiniest, thickest, beautiful hair upon her head. Thank you. Um, and do you know what? I used to have <laughs> the thickest, strongest, shiniest hair. So, podcast listeners, I have been dyeing my hair Funky colours, as Emma said, the blues, the purples, the oranges, the reds, the yellows, the yellows mixed with blues um, for, oh, Emma's just plucked that hair out. I got it. She got it. (laughs) Till the next podcast. Yeah. Um, And so I've been dyeing my hair now for seven years and I have been quite, I suppose, in denial about the fact that it would ever ruin my hair because all of my wonderful, um, delicious hairdressers who've dyed my hair over the years have said, like, your hair's just amazing. It just doesn't get damaged. And then my gorgeous hairdresser, Rachel, she's also just, is when you have your hair dyed by her, it's like hanging out with your best mate. Yeah, she's great. She's great because she's now Emma's hairdresser too. Yay! <laughs> um, over the last two times that we've done my hair, uh, Rachel has said to me, Jess, we need to stop. And we need to stop because, Emma, haven't I just, my hair, everybody, it's like, it's finally happened well, and I've pushed my hair too far. I it's mean, she's broken, still dead. gorgeous. You are absolutely gorgeous, stunning person. I don't person. feel it as much. But your hair is definitely thinner. I'm touching it now. So it's thinner and it's just not as, it's just a bit, it's quite dry. It's dry. Um, and, and snapped. The sad thing is that she's got right around the fit, your your head is bits that have broken off so like where you would have your baby hairs I mean you're rocking it so if you hadn't told me that I wouldn't know because I know people who have hair that's that thin just naturally um but Mm. you have been on a journey I think if I looked at photos even one year ago I have lost a significant amount of my hair and do you think that's not so much dying but the bleaching it's the bleaching, yes. I do bleach my hair and I have done quite radical colour changes um, because I was confident that my... I was like, oh, my hair's just okay with it. But what I haven't been doing, which I can only recommend then, is I have not probably been doing enough hair treatments, hair mm. masks. Whenever I'm asked, oh, do you want a treatment? And I say, oh, what's the price? And then I go, oh, I'm all right, thank you. <laughs> yeah. But I guess it's like any other part of your body. It needs... It needs its attention, it needs focus, it needs its care. So I'm hoping to emerge from quarantine with... Maybe a grown-out side. Yeah, grown-out undercut. undercut And happier hair. And a big bush. (laughs) And a big old bush. (laughs) (laughs) And no more ingrowns. (laughs) So because we are so interested in this topic... We were kind of wondering, okay, but when did this all start? How long has hair been such a marker of identity? And and how long has hair removal been around? How how long has that been a thing? Interestingly, it's been around forever. Ever. Forever. People have always been, for different reasons, managing their body hair in different ways. Um, So we found an interesting article that sort of chronicles the timeline of hair removal and different... particularly body hair. And apparently in 30,000 BC, hair removal was already happening. And they're using apparently sharp shells and shark teeth to pluck hair out of their bodies. Apparently in 2 BC, 2 BC, so quite close to 
C. <laughs> um, the Roman poet Ovid urges, Ovid, I'm not sure, um, urged women to grow so that no rude goat would find his way beneath your arms and that your legs not be rough with bristling hair. So basically, a man's already telling women, get rid of your body hair. Yeah. Which is outrageous. And I don't know if you've noticed images, um, sculptures, sculptures for sure. paintings. Those women are so hairless. Mm-hmm. Um, in the Renaissance, it was it was a sign of class to have no hair and no pubic hair. In 1450, this is a different change. Um, women started removing pubic hair for hygiene because they were afraid of getting lice down there, and I can imagine lice down there would be a nightmare. Mm-hmm. And this was the invention of what's called the merkin. The merkin. And I don't know if any of you have ever heard of a merkin before, but it is actually what you're, is known as a vagina toupee. Mm. So, like a little wig you can wear when you can't have your own hair. And just to say, uh, that would also, should be called actually the vulva toupee, should it not? Uh, exactly. Yeah, correct. You're correct. Just a bit of biology around there. Um, and so that's interesting because that would mean that at that time, 1450, having hair down there was so important that you would buy a wig for it but you would remove it for health reasons yeah. so a bit of a difference from the time before in 1915 sleeveless dresses had suddenly become the style and suddenly armpit hair was visible for women i'm aware that this is quite a, a female identifying heavy kind of um timeline but it does seem that it's been kind of <laughs> more weighted on one side than the other. So suddenly that's when women were encouraged to shave their armpits. But body hair came back trendily, maybe not trendy at this point, but um, with sort of a purpose in 1972 um, when in the rise of feminism um, and the fight for gender equality. And actually the all of the bits after that are sort of moments of when that's been encouraged again all the way up until where we're at in 2020 where it's just been about people reclaiming their body hair doing things Mm. like dyeing it putting Mm. glitter in your armpits for a celebration being okay with your um leg hair with whatever you have can i just ask you emma to read out the quote that i've just seen from carrie bradshaw in sex in the city yes in 2000, the show Sex and the City, uh, starring Sarah Jessica Parker as Carrie, the character Carrie Bradshaw, she's a uh, journalist, a writer, so she um, is always writing about her lifestyle and somehow managing to survive in expensive New York City. Um, she talks about getting her first Brazilian, saying, I got mugged, she took everything I got, because she didn't realise what a Brazilian was going into it. And so that was sort of the beginning of the... Brazilian wax in contemporary time. Yes. And as we said, the Brazilian is where they take most of the hair but leave a strip. And I I can totally empathise with Carrie Bradshaw. I remember accidentally asking for a Hollywood wax, which is where they take everything. And because she was actually a very good wax person and just was very quick and kind of pain <laughs> painless. Mm. Um, and I just remember looking down and being like, oh! Where'd yeah. it all go? I was like, no, I didn't want that. And sometimes they can be quite pushy because of what they expect to be what you want. So I have had people who push my deep bikini wax too far by saying, no, 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 you don't want that there. You don't want that. That'll be visible, blah, blah, blah. Mm. And actually, you, it's quite hard in those positions to be like, mm. but I do want it because, yeah. again, you're quite vulnerable. And once they put the wax there, they do have to remove it. So I think it's really important to have that conversation mm-hmm. very clearly with your whoever's doing it before you start. Mm-hmm. I'd also like to point out on this timeline that it was only in 1996 that they discovered that laser could be used to remove hair um, that without growing back. And then it was not improved by the FDA until 1997. So though I'm going to talk about laser and laser is a good thing that has happened in my life, my more recent laser treatments, it is a very new form of hair removal. So we don't know the long-term impacts of it yet. So if it's not, if you don't have lots of hair and if it's not impacting your daily life, maybe just don't try laser because it's, it's a, I'm a bit scared about what the long-term impacts might mm-hmm. be. Um, because anything where you're using a machine to radiate through your skin into your body is a bit dodge. That being said, yeah. I'm quite happy with my results. <laughs> yeah. 
And I suppose that is, Emma, that, again, it is personal. Yeah. Your hair is your hair to do with what you want, to yeah. decide what you want. If it is hair that kind of works in a way that feels a little bit out of control of yourself, then that's why we all need to be respectful of each other because hair does, for some reason, have such a strong... Well, we know the reasons. It's about social expectations. Yeah. In fact, Jess, you did some research about um, cultural norms and expectations about hair growth and beauty. Yeah, absolutely. I would just like to highlight some hair care traditions um, that I think is important for everybody to acknowledge and know about. So, for example, um, I've spoken about hair dyeing my hair or hair colouring. However, hair colouring has been around as long as human civilization, A lot of the time, naturally occurring plants such as turmeric and henna were used and are used to this day. In Celtic times, Celtic people used lime to whiten their already blonde hair. However, this indeed was linked to creating an ethereal effect, they say. And whilst in ancient Greek, blonde was considered lovely, and um, for Romans, it was seen as a sign of kind of promiscuity. Yeah, which I think is, so it's really important to taking that now, even back then, it meant different things in different places. When we're thinking about hair, it means different styles are appropriate for different bodies and for different places. Yeah. And so it's not up for us to decide who can do what with what Exactly. Hair. And culture is so ingrained in different hairstyles and ways of styling your hair, treating your hair. So it's so important to be respectful of everybody's hair and not ask questions or um, be too personal when talking about somebody's hair. Also, um, let's talk about long hair and spirituality because a number of cultures all around the world um, would never cut their hair for sacred reasons, um, including Indigenous North American groups. Um, Because for um, many Indigenous North American groups, um, to cut off one's hair is to cut off the flow of thought or connection Mm. to a higher power, Mm. right? And many devout Sikhs have um, a similar belief in regards to the spirituality of their hair. Um, And that can include um, their head hair or body hair, even um, the eyebrows. And so these are visible symbols of a person's religion. So it's so important to respect everybody's Mm. hair. And let's talk about dreadlocks as well. Because, yes, dreaded hair is a way of keeping the body's um, natural identity, which is part of the Rastafarian belief system. And I know I'm glad to see that. I'd say, Emma, definitely within a few years now, I think um, a lot of media is starting to talk about the cultural appropriation of dreadlocks. Yeah, definitely. And I know a lot of people who do not understand the root and the meaning and the history of dreadlocks dreading their hair yeah it can just be so disrespectful to I, like you have to know I suppose your choices of why and the history of yeah. style cho- or well it's not a style choice is it um but people might think it is and um, so it's important to respect all different cultures when thinking yeah, of yeah hair. because as we're saying hair is so linked to our identity so of course it's linked to other cultural identities spirituality mm-hmm. um different ways of being in the world Absolutely. And let's just finish on braids. Um, I mean, it says here that braids are much more than a pretty hairstyle. Mm. Some of the very earliest art from around the world depicts adults and children with plaited hair, both on their heads and their beards. And plaited means braids, because I think you only say that in Britain. That is true. I've always called them um, plaits, the type of plaits that I've yeah. had growing up. Yeah, and I have that- no idea why it's called plaits either. It doesn't make sense to me, but that's all right. Yeah, I suppose even if you... Um, bake a pie and you like you cross... braid it don't you say that's braiding you say that's oh, plaiting we say, yeah we plait it oh no we say braiding so we, I've never heard plait before I lived here there we go then incredible I, can I read this section yeah because I think it's um, really important for us to highlight that black women's braids are integral to their culture any star that weaves tresses together is symbolic of the strength of their roots in contemporary community During the slave trade, traffickers would shave slaves' heads to strip them of their identity and humanity. During slavery, the braids even mapped roots to freedom. 
there's just not enough awareness about the importance of different sort of styles in cultures in Western world, particularly white Western world. I mean, even I can... Even on that trip to Bahamas, my sister and I got our hair braided mm-hmm. by the black women on the beach there. And, you know, we were young girls. We didn't really know what it was about. We loved it. It's what all the other people on holiday were doing. It is how those people were making a living. But, of course, mm. that was just in many ways so inappropriate. Um, and there's we just need to be able to talk about it more as white people. And the problem is, is that when a white person might braid their hair or dread their hair. People might say, oh, wow, that looks amazing. Yeah. Whereas the point is, is that throughout history, people have been persecuted, black and ethnic minority people have been persecuted for how their hair naturally grows or how they style their hair. Yet a white person swoops on in, does it, whack some glitter on it, put some dye on it. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. Yeah, and still to this day, there's an expectation that your hair should look a certain way in certain professions um for as particularly for particularly for black women more than any other cultural group mm-hmm. um there's an expectation that their hair should be a different way from how it even materially is mm-hmm. um which is outrageous and we need to mm-hmm. know more about that and in a way i'm actually going to research the history of the undercut and just see if there's anything that i have not picked up on yeah just yeah. to check i'm not appropriating Fair enough. yeah so, um, the final thoughts we want to leave you with, and this is harking back to the body hair element of this. So, moving away from the head and back to the body, I've found a list of 10 hair removal do's and don'ts. And this is to be taken with a grain of salt because every person is different. But if you are in the process of removing your hair, you do want to think about safety first. Can I just suck on my little orange yeah, rind? suck away. Nope. <laughs> Give us some suck sounds. Would you like a... Oh. Oh. Yay, cheers. Cheers. We're eating the orange. Mm. Oh, God, that's good. Mm, it's delicious. Oh. I think we should eat more oranges. Podcast listeners, we did, I mean, we did put this on um, the oranges on our expenses document that we've only just started. Mm. And it's all alcohol so far. <laughs> because we need thematic cocktails, which need thematic liqueurs. <laughs> <laughs> um Right, so hair, <laughs> hair removal do's and don'ts. Um, I think you have to be careful when you want to remove your hair because there's lots of ways to do it that are dangerous for your body. So always consult the professionals and do make sure you are seeking, like Jess said, the actual professionals. And that goes with um, waxing as well as as well as well laser. I've recently, my recent laser experience has been excellent, but she is a registered nurse, this woman. She now does it in her home, in her retirement. But she said, anyone who is not an actual clinician, do make sure um, that they have been trained by a clinician and you should just make sure you're, you're always going through a clinic, not through a salon. Because it's a really invasive treatment, right? And can be quite dangerous and also make it worse as it was in my experience. If you are in the process of waxing, you will get a much cleaner and smoother wax if you let your hair grow. And that's not just to waxable length, but the longer your hair is, the more even your wax is. Mm -hmm. Um, It hurts more when it's longer, but it'll be cleaner and clearer. Can I just throw in, whilst we're talking about hair removal, Mm -hmm. I am so attracted to people with body hair. Oh, yeah. (laughs) This is just if it's something that you want to do. And it is something I want to do. So I just want to make sure you're doing it the right way. Um, don't worry about the direction in which you shave. And this is a big thing because lots of people say really? you always need to shave in this direction. Otherwise, it'll grow funny directions. Well, folks, my hair already grows every direction. So uh. if I were to only shave in one direction or do what is instructed, I wouldn't get it all. And also I would be in fits of anxiety about how much hair was going to grow back in certain ways. Shave it whatever way gets it off. Do you know, I had no idea about that until that very second you told me. Amazing. I mean, this this website here says razors today are so advanced that you can shave in any direction that works for you. I also have recently invested in a safety razor, so I've gone back to old fashioned. So actually, that doesn't count at all. <laughs> Screw I must that. admit, the 99p razors from Poundland, oh, I just... Maybe yeah. if, you, if you can just invest a little bit more if you're gonna well, buy a razor. The safety razor is there's no plastic in it, um, and it's back to like actual razor blades, and you put it in. It's the very close shave. I cannot do it quickly. I have to do it slowly. 
but it is so worth the investment. And also I am not throwing out any plastic at any point of the month to do with my hair removal. So that's a very important thing for me. Don't soak too long in the bathtub before raising. And I'm guilty of this. I tend to do it at the end. Um, but apparently you should do it closer to the beginning of your bath. Don't shave when your skin is over soaked and about to get wrinkly as this can lead to cuts and an uneven shave. Ah, pruny fingers, pruny toes. Exactly. Do change your blades often. Now this does apply to my safety razor, but it also applies to your disposable razors. It applies to anything. It's when it goes rusty and you're still oh, shaving gross. with it. Yeah, and you're no. Like, this is Brutal. a bad idea. But also it's going to take longer. It's going to make more ingrown hairs happen. It's just mm. not a nice thing. Um, do you use oils or gel lotions after waxing or threading? Yeah, you need to moisturize afterwards. But mm-hmm. you do not need to before. And oils are much better than a moisturizer because the chemicals and scents in moisturizers can really hurt your skin. Right. But the oils are just going to get you back to so healthy. Just a nice coconut oil. Exactly. What about exactly. just rubbing some olive oil on your skin? Sunflower oil that you could you stir fry with? <laughs> I've not tried it, but I can imagine it's just as good. Um, also, you can use aloe vera gel, aloe vera, depending on where you're from, mm-hmm. um, after laser hair removal. So... When I get my laser done, it's so intense that I have to do it on a Friday when I have no plans for the weekend and not seeing anyone till Monday. For my own vanity, but also because my face will be red and sore for two days mm-hmm. afterwards. It's less sore the less hair you have, but I literally have to put an ice pack on it for the whole first day. Mm-hmm. Um, so anything that's going to see the sunburn, because it's burn, it's like a laser burning your skin. Right. Does it um, feel like gonna, you, you're it, like Yeah, it, especially when it's really hairy at oh, the beginning. Um, but I think it was worth it for me for my own mental health and love for my own face. This is also really important. If you are doing laser, do not be tempted to pluck or wax or bleach because if you change the consistency of the hair or remove it, you're paying to have them zap nothing, right? Right. So they can only get rid of it if it's there under the skin. You can shave it as much as you want, but if you've removed the whole follicle, there's nothing for it to get and then you'll be disappointed with the results. Um, so invest in a good face razor or whatever it is um, and just be diligent about shaving that area, but do not pull it out even as though it's so tempting. Uh, if you're going to use a hair removal cream, which I already said is disgusting, so I advise against... Get a nose peg. <laughs> Get a nose peg, but also um, do a patch test and that would be the same for waxing. I'm quite sensitive. I have to use sensitive wax when I yeah. go to places. I can't use the normal wax. So, um, yeah, do a patch test because your body might react badly. And this final tip, which is vital, and when I learned this tip, changed my life. Yeah. Take a painkiller Yeah. before <gasps> you're waxing. I've never done that. You might need to test out. You might need to ask your doctor. It's not for everyone. But uh, I've taken an ibuprofen or a Tylenol, which is not, you don't have here, but I have in Canada. So if you're in Canada listening. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just dulls it a little bit, especially if you're doing your deep bikini. Brazilian. Yeah. Well, I do like to. <laughs> so my current um, waxer for the old um vulva region um actually speaks italian isn't italian but speaks italian and i'm learning italian at the moment so it's been a strange time of getting things waxed and practicing my italian but then sometimes there's a point where i put in my earplugs i might listen to a podcast oh really so podcast listeners maybe you want to listen to us if you're doing any hair removal yeah don't feel like you have to sustain chats while your bum cheeks are spread apart and the ripping hair out of your body yeah i mean just focus on breathing yeah <laughs> oh and it's so ridiculous everybody i know we're saying this and i do it but it is ridiculous to know that you are just trying not to cry sometimes or you are doing deep breaths like this is the reality of having mm. a wax um and i just also just want to shout out that it's such a personal journey. And if yeah. you aren't doing the waxes, yeah, good for you. <laughs> yeah. Well done. Be brave. Keep the hair if you want to. Yeah, keep the hair. Don't remove it. <laughs> I think we're coming from a position where we are so hair positive, body hair positive, but both have our yeah things. But Emma, yours is very a long journey, a long history of trauma with yeah. In hormonal hair changes. In fact, when I first changes. met Ingrid, she is like, 
a beautiful little hairless mole. She just has nothing on her, but she's got beautiful locks on her head, curly hair, but her body is just blessed with no hair. And it's astounding. Well, you say to blessed me. with no hair, but we can also say blessed with loads of hair. Yes, of course. This is from my perspective. And she was saying, she made the mistake of saying at my a family event, a family dinner, that uh, <laughs> she doesn't think that hair is an issue for her. And the reaction she got from my family, the hatred and disgust that she got from my whole family was astounding. Um, but it's great because she comes from a perspective of she's never had any issues with hair. So she doesn't care where what the hair is on my body whereas I think yeah I have more of an expectation for other people's body hair because of my own expectations whereas yeah. she's never built any expectations I just feel like Ingrid's not even thinking about the hair on your body she's looking at your eyes <laughs> <laughs> or listening to your charming chat oh yeah well it's it's incessant so of course she's listening <laughs> to me she better be listening to me <laughs> Emma, any more do's and don'ts for our podcast listeners? That's it. So my cheeky little conclusion, everybody. First of all, I'd like to um, shout out to two amazing queer barbers. Um, I mentioned Open Barbers earlier. There's also Barberette. So Open Barbers and Barberette are two fantastic ones. And this one I do not know. I know that one. I've researched it. Oh, my gosh. Well, get on out. Barber Streisand. Excellent. And these are London-based barbers in particular. So, But I guarantee if you Google in your bigger cities, probably not the small ones, but in the big cities, LGBTQ plus friendly barbers. Yeah. Regardless of whether you identify that way, even if you're straight and you want an undercut or you want something that where they're not going to say, oh, but your hair is so beautiful. Why do you want to chop it all off? Yeah. Go to one of them. (laughs) And also, if you do want to go and you are not LGBTQIA+, then you're just supporting a lovely community. So get involved. I'm sure you'll have the best chat. And I would just like to ask everybody... Um, as I've said, my hair, my head hair has taken a complete turn for me, the worst, because it is broken, dry, damaged, um, and quite visibly so. So if anybody has a home remedy or knows of something um, that I can order possibly <laughs> online for dry, broken, damaged, snap hair... For me to go into um, hair recovery... Whilst, hair quarantine. Hair quarantine whilst um, in quarantine. Please, can you let me know just anything that I can do to get this back? Like, my hair is just, quite frankly, fucked. <laughs> no, it's it'll come back. We just need some tips and advice. Yes, please. It's time for you to give us some tips and advice. Um, And if you also want to get in touch and let us know any of your hair wins or hair fails, that can be body hair, that can be head hair. We've loved listening to people's stories about all of our topics so far. Follow us on Instagram or Twitter. Um, We are at Fluff Creatives or email us at fluffinquiries at gmail.com. Hair solidarity and... Happy plucking or happy shaving or happy growing. Thanks for listening and don't forget to rate and subscribe. We're excited to welcome you into our Fluff family and bring you some gorgeous sparkles every Friday. (laughs) 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 (laughs)